Hello and welcome back to Cooking the Books with me, Jilly Smith, the podcast which takes us through four food moments from the books of our favourite food writers. And this week I'm with a man after my own heart. There are very few people who write about TV chefs and their place in British food culture, but I had so much to talk about with Kevin Geddes, author of Keep Calm and Fanny On. With Fanny, you always have the feeling that if you did it wrong, uh, which means if you didn't do exactly as Fanny told you to do, she would come round to knock at your door and um, get, you know sort you out by telling you to do it her way. On December the 28th at 9pm, Channel 5 is showing an hour-long documentary called The 1970s Dinner Party, featuring a whole load of celebs around the table in a fabulous recreation of when Britain first put on its pinny. And as the author of Taste and the TV Chef, which tells the story of how TV taught Britain to eat, I'm one of the experts, along with Dr Annie Gray. Yep, a pinch-me moment. Kevin's book was a must-read as part of the prep, but I had to ask him, why Fanny Craddock? Oh, well, she's just so amazing. You know, I just, I, I really came from that as my starting point. I think she's brilliant. Um, I think once you've seen her, heard her, you know, know what she's all about, you, you can't forget her. So I just wanted to know more and more about her. When, when I was growing up in the 70s, she was around, but, you know, not cooking on TV or, or anything anymore. But she was still very much a kind of figure there that everyone spoke about. And, you know, 40, 50 years later, she's still being talked about. So there, there's something there's something pretty special about her, I, I reckon. Well, I think you're probably right. Um, now, you and I, amongst a very tiny, tiny little community of people who write about <laughs> TV chefs. And uh, the reason we're talking today is because um, I was part of a Channel 5 series um, that I know that you talked to as well about the 1970s dinner party. Now, my thing is, is sort of TV chefs over all the years. But we did talk a lot about Fanny, um, as well as the Galloping Gourmet and, and all the rest of it. And what was interesting was her role, and this is what I really want to ask you about, in the construction of uh, British food culture. Um, she was a little bit before it, I would say. Um, but, you know, it was at a time, sort of 1950s to 1970s, really, where we were sort of playing with food and who we were. What's your take on who we were as a nation around food when when Fanny was first cooking in the 1950s and into the 70s? Well, you know, I think that Fanny herself kind of symbolises that change in, in food from the 50s to the 70s. You know, in the in the 50s, food was still very drab, you know, the, the rationing was still around, you know, people were still kind of mindful about um, not having things and not wasting things, not having excessive things, you know, being very modest. And, and that was in food too. Uh, and Fanny kind of um, took that idea, turned it on its head and, and ran with it. She was like, actually, you can have modest, decent food that's not going to cost the earth. But why the heck shouldn't it look amazing? Why not add in every food colour in that you could ever think of? Why not present it in really unusual ways? You know, why not? stick a pair of pigeon wings in your mashed potatoes. Your green mashed potatoes. They had to be green. They had to be green. <laughs> so, you know, she just wanted to make us smile. It just made her different. You know, um, things were still black and white. So she published a lot in newspapers. They were in black and white. Um, she started on TV when it was black and white. So she wanted ways to describe things that were full of colour and kind of match her personality, which was very colourful. Her, her whole, whole life was colourful. Um, she chose things like green mashed potatoes very, very simply because no one else was doing it. No one else would have thought of doing it. Nobody wanted to do it really. Um, who would dye their potatoes green? But, you know, she would. And she she just wanted to be different and to be remembered for things like that. And, you know, th thank goodness. But it's interesting, isn't it? Because actually, you know, we do think of the pantomime dame with the drawn on eyebrows and the ball gown. I mean, all those are very conflated memories of, of Fanny. None of them are, well, some, some of them are true, but, you know, not consistently true. 
actually, she was one of the early proper authorities on food. She and Johnny, as the Bon Viveur team, they they were writing for newspapers um, before she was, well, kind of while she was doing television as well. But they were very among the very few people to actually travel around the continent and and also Britain and taste and report back on, on real food. That's why I don't really get why she had to make her mashed potato green and why she had to kind of uh, pastiche herself because she was somebody who worked really hard uh, at at learning her trade and being on every platform that she could possibly get onto. Yeah, and, you know, it, it's difficult. I think you said at the beginning of uh, what you just said that some of those memories get conflated and, and changed. So a lot of our memories, particularly of uh Fanny Craddock, uh, come from the 1970s and, you know, absolutely nothing wrong with that. But by that time, she was well into her 60s. She'd been cooking on TV for decades. She'd done everything, been everywhere. And, she, you know, she was a little bit fed up with it. So things became much bigger, bolder, greener mashed potatoes than ever before. But, you know, it didn't really start out that way. It just started out as a gimmick, something to get her noticed. And she kind of got saddled with it a little bit, and uh, it you know became part of her style to 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 do that. So yeah, you're you know you're right. She travelled around Europe, and um, she wrote uh, restaurant reviews, um, food columns, lots of different things. She was a fashion icon as well. Um, she wrote fashion columns. She featured in Vogue magazine. You know, lots of things that you don't associate with her uh, when she was younger. So maybe in her 40s, I'm saying younger, that's when her career started. I mean, she was absolutely prolific, wasn't she? She And she, she was prolific in the food world, but she was also prolific as a children's book writer. She was a dressmaker. She, you know, she did all sorts of things. There's a drive to this woman that sort of suggests something other. What did you find as you researched? What was the other? Yeah, I mean, I often describe her as an entrepreneur and she's got that kind of get up and go attitude. But also um, she just had this amazing, as you say, drive. She never stopped. Uh, you know, wouldn't be surprised if she ever slept properly. You know, she was the sort of person who would get up in the middle of the night and start doing something new. Um, a lot of it came from her background. You know, she had a really um, unhappy um, upbringing, a really uh, not very stable upbringing. Her father was a playwright and uh, uh, an author as well. Her mother was a very flamboyant actress. They both had very precarious incomes. Her father um, liked to drink, he liked to gamble, he didn't really have much regard for family life. So, you know, she didn't really have that financial stability, I think, growing up. So when she was able to um, fend for herself and, and carve out a career for herself, she just went for it. I think always with that fear that she could lose it. That's a really interesting driver, isn't it? Um, you know, she was given away by her mother to her grandmother when her mother was 18, wasn't she? And she spent the first 10 years with her grandmother, who was like the aunt in Gigi, wasn't she? She kind of <laughs> taught her everything. She taught her manners. She taught her to be a young lady. And I wonder if that sort of weird rupture between, you know, not not being wanted by her mother. There's a made-up quality about Fanny Craddock, isn't there? Her name, not least. But the the kind of construction of her by her grandmother, I wonder if there's something in there that has a sort of a false base and that is all performance, which led to this kind of performative TV chef who we kind of know and some people love. Yeah, you know, Fanny herself traced everything that she did back to her grandmother. And whether her grandmother was really as she described or, you know, in a fantasy as she described, we'll, ne we'll never know. But she was certainly from another time. And her grandmother loved flamboyance. She loved theatre. She loved performance. And she herself loved colour. So maybe coming back to your question about colour, um, Fanny's grandmother loved pink and everything was pink. All the food was pink, the house was pink, all the decorations were pink. So, you know, maybe she absorbed uh, a lot of that flamboyance and performance style from her grandmother. But also, 
you know, probably from her, her own mother as well, who, uh, as I mentioned, was a, an actress. Um, not that I've been able to find that she was a very successful actress, but she, she was a stage actress, you know, of a different time. So I think that Fanny borrowed the best of that from both her grandmother and her mother and, and brought them into, yeah, her, her own creation. You know, before she became Fanny Craddock, she was plain old Phyllis. Um, she went by the name Frances. And, you know, she, she really didn't have much to make her stand out. So she made herself stand out. You know, everything she did, you know, was with this drive and desire that you would never forget her. Um, you would always employ her again, but you would never forget her. Yeah. And of course, she was operating in a world that was actively constructing uh, a new way of being. This is post-war. We could be anything. But of course, TV and radio very much um, was constructing this idea of who we are. And of, we had this, of the American dream of the, of the housewife with the pinny on and the stilettos. And that's very much, take the pinny off, she never wore a pinny. Uh, never. But never. Um, but she, it was very much, that was the role of the housewife to impress, to, to put amazing food or amazing looking food anyway on the table to impress your husband's boss. Yet she was, I mean, would you call her a feminist? Um, yeah, I think, you know, with retrospect, definitely, you know, she was somebody who said that, you know, you can do it all, you can have all the different careers, you can go wherever you like. And, you know, it was very unusual for women at that time to, to have, you know, one set career, never mind as many as she did. Very unusual for women at the time to travel, to, um, you know, work in 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 the media, really, a, a kind of male-dominated industry. Um, but she did it all the time with her husband. Uh, he wasn't really her husband, Johnny, at her side. Um, you know, part of that performance of, um, you know, we're a respectable couple, really. But, you know, she was very much in charge. She, later in her life, she always said that she, she wasn't a feminist. She just believed in herself and she didn't really think about other women. Um, but I think in, in some ways, maybe that's a feminist statement too, you know, that, that she's saying, actually, just, you know, drive yourself forward and do your best. Be the best Fanny Craddock that you can be. Uh, and that's certainly what she was. I think you'll find that feminism is all about sisterhood, Kevin, actually. Well, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, yes, obviously. But, you know, in, in her version, her version of it, you know, was very much just, a, I will be a role model. I will uh, just look after myself, really. So perhaps she wasn't a feminist, but uh, she, she definitely uh, subscribed to a lot of the uh, philosophies, I guess, that, that we'd recognise now. Yeah, I think that, you know, what you're talking about is actually operating in a patriarchal society. Um, I mean, you know, we still do, but actually at that time, um, you know, particularly playing Auntie Beeb, you know, the BBC at that time, particularly it still is, according to the BBC Charter, it is there to entertain, educate and inform. But Auntie Beeb had this sort of caricature, didn't it? It was teaching people to eat and cook uh, frugally, but interestingly, and the, the, Auntie Beeb was literally teaching women how to be in this new society, this new post-war society. And she was the kind of the emblem of Auntie Beeb in many ways. But operating in that patriarchy, she had to probably step on a lot of stilettos and certainly elbow a lot of women out the way. I think I, I would look at her as a trailblazer, a pioneer, but I don't think there was a lot of sisterhood there. Um, the Queen Mother, however, told Fanny that, um, and I think this is in your book, actually, that um, that, she, that Bon Viveur were mainly responsible for the improvement in catering standards since the war. Um, Keith Floyd declared that she changed the whole nation's cooking attitudes and Esther Ranson said she created the cult of the TV chef. Massive, massive claims uh, that we wouldn't necessarily put next to that ball-gowned pastiche of, of the woman that we know. Um in your food moments, we're going to kind of go through who she was through some of the the recipes that she cooked on on television. You start with Duchess potato. Why? Well, I, I guess first and foremost, it was one of her very favourite recipes, you know, herself. Um, but for me, I think it it kind of sums up what she was all about. So it was just something simple that she could take and elevate to be something spectacular. 
So not just mashed potatoes, she was going to do Duchess potatoes. She liked that link to royalty, even in the name. So you, you mentioned that the Queen Mother was a fan. We've only got Fanny's word for that. But, you know, <laughs> that was that was the kind of thing that she did. You know, she would drop in these associations. You know, she was friends with the Duke and Duchess of Windsor. Um, they, they weren't going to deny it. She mentioned that Prince Philip was a bit flirty with her at various uh, events. Again, he wouldn't say, no, I wasn't. Um, so, you know, they, they kind of go down in, in history. And it's the same kind of feeling with her Duchess potatoes. They're really just mashed potatoes with a bit of egg and a bit of butter beaten, beaten together, whipped up and piped out into various shapes. And again, this is a another key thing for her. She loves anything that can be piped. So, of course, she coloured them green because savoury things have to be green and she would pipe them into um, shapes, into pyramids, into trees, into words. She uh, piped out the name Bon Viveur uh, when she was um, uh, promoting her own autobiography in Duchess Potatoes. They, they're kind of linked with her throughout her career. She was always showing them. Um, people think of them at Christmas. Uh, on her Christmas shows, she always has green Duchess potatoes. Um, she pipes them into big mounds and sits uh, roast chickens on top of them. Um, they just look really bizarre, but at the end of the day, they're everyday mashed potatoes just made a little bit more special. And I, for, for me, I think that's what, what Fanny's all about. A lot of people say that she couldn't cook and her recipes didn't work, but actually they, they did. And if you follow her basic recipe for, for Duchess potatoes, um, you choose whether you want to put green food colouring in or not. Um, they're, they're great and they do pipe out and they make amazing um, shapes and, and forms. Um, add a little bit of green food colouring and people gasp when they see it and say, oh my God, what's that? Uh, and that's the reaction that she wanted and that's the reaction that she herself got. So I would always choose um, Duchess potatoes uh, for Franny. <laughs> you know, it's interesting what you say about her recipes actually working. You know, very often um, something is created uh, in resistance to something else. And perhaps Fanny on her own wouldn't have been called a TV chef. She was just Fanny Craddock on the telly. Um, but it was only when Delia kind of came along, whose recipes did always work too, but had a very, very different style about her, that perhaps the that was the resistance that kind of made people think about the concept of something like a TV chef. I mean, how does Delia compare in terms of uh, performance as a TV chef. Yeah, well, I actually think they've got much more in common than they have uh, apart, really. Um, you know, they've got similar kind of starts to their career. Delia um, started in, in radio and newspapers. She also did restaurant reviews and, and travel pieces. She found her way onto TV through styling. You know, Fanny would think that was amazing. Um, and, um, you know, she, she kind of started by teaching people to cook. Fanny did the same thing. So although we can't see them, her programmes in the 1950s were really quite basic. You know, this is how you um, how you do very particular um, recipes and techniques. By the time the ones that survive in the 70s are, are shown, um, you know, you can hear Fanny Craddock say, I've already shown you this for 20 years. Um, just got on and do it. And I think that Delia came through perhaps that same journey. Um, like Delia, Fanny wasn't a chef. You know, she wasn't trained. Um, she connected with people really well. You know, I think that that Fanny Craddock's probably um, the first um, TV cook who kind of looked directly down the lens and spoke to people at home. You know, there wasn't any pretense that it was a, a, a studio and there was a, a huge audience. It was very one-on-one. -on -one. And I think Delia does that too and encourages you, perhaps more gently than Fanny did, to, to cook. So with Fanny, you always had the feeling that if you did it wrong, uh, which means if you didn't do exactly as Fanny told you to do, she would come round to knock at your door and, um, get, you know, sort you out. And, and by that, I mean sort you out by telling you to do it her way. Um, Delia was much more gentle, but, but that same kind of 
encouraging um, aspect, I suppose, just in a different way. Yeah, I mean, and I suppose Delia actually grew up watching Fanny uh, because D- Delia didn't start appearing on our televisions until the 70s, um, by which time, you know, to, to many people, Fanny was that weird pantomime dame kind of character who was very cross with everyone. Your second food moment is <clears throat> very 70s, um, Sherry Trifle. Um, you've chosen Fanny's mum's trifle, but actually, you know, th- what that was and all these kind of Swiss rolls and all those sort of things, they were terrifying to make, actually. And, you know, I wanted to kind of ask you what you thought about the the, the early use of food to make us feel really bad about ourselves. Um, you know, the, the good enough mum just didn't exist in those times. You know, they were chucking down the Valium to try and get through the the dinner party for the husband. It was all about making it look amazing uh, to to produce something that nobody had ever seen before. I mean, women in the 1970s must have been absolutely at the end of their wits. How did Fanny kind of contribute to that incredible sort of anxiety that we, we now know that those women suffer from? Yeah, I I think that um, perhaps unintentionally she contributed hugely to that. You know, she was all about aspiration, you know, so beneath that, I suppose, that kind of feeling that actually what you're doing is never enough. You should always be trying to do more um, was really her ethos. So um, just because she whizzed around at a million miles an hour, she expected everyone else to. So I think that she did contribute to that hugely. Um, you know, there's a huge pressure from her to get things to not only um, cook well, taste good, but, you know, as you say, look fantastic, but also yourself to look fantastic and presentable when everyone came round to your house for a buffet or when your uh, husband's boss came round for dinner, you'd be able to impress them with just, you know, how magically you'd produced all this food. You know, she, uh, a a lot of her early cooking, she uh, performed a a kind of theatre piece called Kitchen Magic. Uh, And that's what she believed that really people should just think, my goodness, where did all this amazing food just magically appear from? Um, but really frantically, you should be uh, be making it happen behind the scenes. And I think when it came to Christmas, um, this was when she became particularly obsessed. So she, she said that she wanted everyone to have a very easy Christmas. And, you know, it's the one day of the year that uh, women should be able to enjoy uh, the food that they've cooked. But in order to do that, she instructed you to start thinking about it in January and start cooking in January and lay things away. So you'd be toiling away for the whole year just to produce this amazing spread. And yeah, as I say, I don't think she was intending to uh, make the the housewives of Britain into these uh, domestic slaves uh, that she hated so much. But I think it was definitely an unintended consequence of what she did and uh, the the kind of uh, ethos that she had of that aspiration and uh, you know you you can do better yeah and you should do better um, yeah. and your third food moment is is another example of this although you say this cake the famous white christmas cake um is absolutely amazing and you'd encourage people to give it a try yeah, I think it's one of those almost forgotten cakes. So she cooks it on her Christmas show, which survives from the 70s and is uh, shown every year. And the BBC have it on an iPlayer in their archive section. And she produces two different cakes, a, a kind of dark, traditional, heavy fruit cake, and this lighter version, which has, you know, glassy pineapple in it and is flavoured with rose water and orange water. And, you know, she puts all her favourite things in it. Um, So things like glassy Angelica, uh, which is a very unusual taste. Uh, But, you know, if you like gin, you're going to like Angelica. Um, So, you know, all these tastes mixed together. It's a much lighter, uh, both in appearance and in texture cake. But it's got a lovely taste. And, you know, it doesn't taste very Christmassy. It tastes almost tropical. Uh, But but then that's quite nice. It's nice for a change. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the thing that sticks in my mind more than any other recipe is your fourth uh, food moment, the mince meat omelette. 
I mean, it's so revolting. And what is so interesting about that, that is the 1970s, isn't it? It's, it's, a mu- it's quite a late recipe. And if you only look through YouTube, for example, and you're finding the re- those recipes, they tend to be the quite the, the later ones. And you just think, what on earth is she doing? She's totally belied all her authority, her, you know, the great recipes that really did work. All that information that she used to bring for as bon viveur uh, from all over the the world. What was she thinking? I I honestly can say what was she thinking? You know, it's it's a it's a horrible recipe. You know, I'm I'm the person that that goes around saying, oh, actually, she was great. You know, her food's lovely. I've made almost everything that that she suggested. It all is all great. The only thing which turns my stomach is the mincemeat omelette. And it's also the way that she presents it. So she cooks it bavos because, of course, she was snobby and pretended to be French. And, and that just means that it's not cooked through properly. It's still wet. It still kind of drips around on the plate. And then you add more wet, soggy uh, mincemeat that's left over to that. And she maintains that it's fabulous. I I, I struggle with sweet omelettes anyway, um, but uh, a mincemeat omelette is just not the way to go, you know. And she had so many lovely things that she could have done with that mincemeat instead that she did throughout her career. Um, mincemeat Swiss rolls are fantastic. Mincemeat, uh, you know, galettes and things like that, you know, that she could have done. But instead, this mincemeat omelette. And, you know, it it haunts her because it is the thing that people remember. It is the thing that people say, oh, that sounds horrible. But it's also one of the things that people say, do you know what? I'll give that a try. It can't be as bad as it seems. But it always is. It always (laughs) is. But I wonder if she'd kind of lost the plot by that time, because it's not very far away from her catastrophic fall from grace. Um, What do you think she was? She was. Well, first of all, tell us about the Gwen Troke moment. Yeah. So, uh, again, it's one of these um, times that people remember Fanny and, you know, associate her with. So she was on a programme in 1976 with uh, with Esther Ranson called The Big Time. Um, so the premise was that uh, ordinary people would try and get into extraordinary jobs and each episode featured a different expert helping them to do it. So Gwen Troke featured in this one particular episode. She was uh, supposedly uh, a very ordinary Devon housewife who wanted to get into the food business and uh, into restaurants, etc. So Fanny was tasked with, with helping her. Um, uh, create a sensational menu uh, at the Dorchester, you know, just completely in Congress for, for a Devon housewife. Uh, anyway, but Esther Ranson um, presented this programme and produced the programme, actually. Um, and, uh, you know, it was a really popular kind of, uh, you know, again, probably ahead of its time uh, type of show where established celebrities helped ordinary people to, to do something uh, special. Uh, people say it backfired and, uh, you know, Fanny Fanny wasn't all that complimentary to, to Gwen Troke and her ideas. She wasn't all that bad, actually, if you look back in, in, in hindsight. But they say that she lost her television career, that she uh, had her contract at the BBC cancelled, all these kind of things as a result. She but didn't the, have a contract at the BBC, did the, she? The reality was she didn't. She, she never in her life had a contract at the BBC other than, you know, a one-off contract for a programme. She, she, she wasn't employed by the BBC. Um, she didn't lose her career. She, she cooked on TV several times after that. But it's one of these myths that surrounds her and, and people love to... Uh, hang on to these myths and and probably Fanny would be responsible for um, putting these myths around as well and kind of fanning the flames because again that's when people remember her so the actual story of the uh, Gwen Troke incident is uh, you know fairly pedestrian really you know Fanny and Gwen had worked together several years before that with uh, Esther Ranson and Esther Ranson remembered that they had some chemistry and brought them together for this show where they had to pretend that they'd never met before and you know all this kind of stuff so it was a bit of a, a kind of rehash of, of something that had happened before but for Fanny it was great 
It meant that she could appear on TV, uh, but not cook the same old things again and again and again. You know, by this time, she'd been on TV for over 20 years. So, you know, in a similar way to uh, Nigella now, you know, if Nigella was being asked just to cook the same things every series, I'm sure she would get quite bored. So that, that was the kind of mode that Fanny was in. And she saw herself not retiring from TV, but retiring from cooking on TV, definitely. So it was an opportunity for her. So, yeah, those... Those Christmas programmes in 1975 were kind of her her greatest hits, if you like. You know, she 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 thought of it as the last series that she was going to do, and she tried to stuff as much in there. Uh, but you can hear it if you if you watch them back. She'll say, "I've been showing you this for years, uh, but you want to see it again, so here we go." You know, and she's 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 quite bored of it. It was an afternoon show; it wasn't her usual kind of. A high performance evening, uh, top of the rating show. You know, it was a, a little um, afternoon filler of 15 minutes. You know, she didn't really pay much attention to it. Yeah. But I mean, she did transcend it, that moment. She, you know, yeah. because she has yeah. become a legend. Uh, Nigella, who you, you just mentioned, you know, uh, featured one of her recipes in one of her Christmas shows. Um, uh, I can't remember which series it was, but one of the early series in the early 2000s. One of the early Christmas ones, yeah. Yeah. And she is definitely part of our food uh, history. But she stands for something that we no longer are. Uh, she stands for the sort of the performance of food and we are becoming much more stable as a food culture now. I mean, what, are, what do you think that Fanny would say if she were sitting with us now? Would she see herself as a as a major part of the construction of, of this food culture that we have now? Or would she just not recognise us at all? I think she would she would recognise it and she would claim that yeah she was the beginnings of it you know she'd she'd done all this she would I'm sure she would look at things like TikTok and social media and say that that was me and um, that's what I did and she'd be all over it but I think probably if she'd survived you know and God, she would be some age by now, but she would be doing something entirely different because she just moved on so much. She she wouldn't be doing food. She she would be doing something entirely different. But yeah, she would recognise that um, the roots of what she did were were there in television, in uh, newspaper, magazine, social media, all those kind of things. When people talk about food, she would say, yeah, that that's what I did. Thanks for listening. Do rate and review the podcast over on Apple Podcasts and then head to my Substack to see some extra bites from the Channel 5 show.